स्वभक्ति सिद्धांत चर्यामृतानी सिद्धांत चर्यामृतानी गौराब्धिरेतरमुना विर्णरमुना विर्ण रनालयता प्रयाति
Tej Nyanatwa of knowledge of devotional service. Ratna Aliyatam the quality of being an ocean containing valuable jewels. Prayati achieve. Translation by Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta, Swami Shri Prabhupada. Translation, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who is known as Gauranga, is the ocean of all conclusive knowledge in devotional service. He empowers Sri Ramanand Rai, who may be likened to a cloud of devotional service. This cloud was filled with the water of all the conclusive purports of devotional service. <coughs> and was empowered by the ocean to spread this water over the sea of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself. Thus the ocean of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu became filled with the jewels of the knowledge of pure devotional service. There is no purport here. Om Jnana Timirandhasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishthaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavati Pashatya Deshatarine Vancha Kalpataru Vesha Krupa Sindhu Bhavacha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasadi Gaurabhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna so I'm grateful to be here amongst all of you at the lotus feet of their lordships. And I was asked to speak because Adhashtami is coming soon to speak on the topic of Gaudiya Vaishnavism, appreciating its distinctive contribution. So I will speak in the next three, four classes, whatever time we have, on the theme of from love universal to bhakti confidential. Uh, how there is a progression that is revealed and a pathway that is provided by the teachings of Vaishnavism as given by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So, uh, <clears throat> let me first talk about what this verse is uh, saying. Now, the Chaitanya Charitamrit is the seminal book of Gaudiya Vaishnavism. There are many biographies of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu which were written before Chaitanya Charitamrita. So, all of them are considered important Gaudiya Vaishnava books. The word Gaudiya Vaishnavism itself means Vaishnavism is that uh, school of thought which considers Vishnu to be the supreme. And Gaudiya has multiple meanings. One can refer to Gaudadesh, the area on the coast of Ganga and other places nearby, where this system of thought was first revealed in the world. The word Gauda also, uh, Gaudiya Vaishnava has explained, <coughs> has an inner meaning. <coughs> so Gaudiya Vaishnavism is not geographically restricted to any particular place. It is actually the eternal longing of the human heart to love God that is manifested at a particular place. The word Gauda also has a second meaning, which is good which is related to the Guda or Jaggery. So Jaggery is present in various parts of the world, but the Jaggery that is available in Bengal is especially sweet. It's almost like chocolate. So similarly, Vaishnavism, the principle of learning to love God, is manifest in various parts of the world. But as it was revealed by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, it has an especial sweetness to it. And that is what is signified by the word Gaudiya Vaishnavism. So, 
वी आर शिल प्रभुपाद एंड वी आर द फॉलोअर्स ऑफ शिल प्रभुपाद एंड शिल प्रभुपाद कम्स इन अ लाइन ऑफ स्पिरिचुअल टीचर्स कमिंग फ्रॉम श्री चैतन्य महाप्रभु सो चैतन्य महाप्रभुज टीचिंग्स स्पेशली फोकस्ड ऑन द प्रिंसिपल ऑफ द प्रिंसिपल एंड द प्रोसेस फॉर लविंग कृष्णा एंड ही टॉट बाई हिज एग्जाम्पल of how to absorb oneself in love for krishna and he taught philosophically also how this is the conclusion of all the philosophy that is given in the vedic literature learning to love krishna that is the conclusion vedaishya sarvai aham eva vidyo as krishna says in the bhagavad gita in 15.15 now uh, after chaitanya mahaprabhu departed he himself did not write many books his primary legacy was the shikshashtakam so after he departed the literary legacy came in two forms one was the philosophical books that were written by the goswamis in vrindavan they were written mostly in sanskrit and they were written to establish gaudiya vaishnavism's respectability among the brahmanical community in vrindavan and north india at large so these were books in sanskrit and they were books about philosophy they focused primarily on krishna leela or on krishna tattva bhakti tattva hmm? and there were books which were written by the followers of chaitanya mahaprabhu in bengal itself which were primarily biographical and they were in the vernacular language bengali and these folk these focus primarily on keeping alive the memory of the wonderful past times that lord chaitanya had performed just recently so these two branches of literary legacy developed quite distinctly one was biographical and vernacular in bengali and mostly the past times of lord chaitanya and the other was philosophical and sanskritic it was in the it was sanskrit has been the language of the intellectual elite, elite in india and chaitanya charitamrita is the book that brings these two literary legacies together in one masterpiece that is both biographical and theological so krishnadas kaviraj goswami was born and brought up in bengal and he was steeped in chaitanya leela throughout his life and then eventually he was instructed by lord ityananda prabhu in a dream to go to vrindavan and there he studied under the goswamis assimilated the philosophy and he wrote the chaitanya charitamrit which is externally it might seem to be just like a biography but it is much much more than a biography it is actually a book of theology in the genre of a biography so that means he used the events chronologically in chaitanya charitamrit but at the same time whenever any philosophical discussion happens he like zooms in on it and elaborately describes the discussion and through that he expounds the teachings of lord chaitanya mahaprabhu also so because both these literary legacies the biographical and the theological were combined in one book chaitanya charitamrit by shri krishna das kaviraj goswami so after this book was written this book chaitanya charitamrit became like the final word for gaudiya understanding gaudiya vaishnavas of course other books are important but this is a single book which in a fairly comprehensive way gives us both the past times and the philosophy of the uh, of chaitanya mahaprabhu and <clears throat> among the various philosophical conversations that chaitanya mahaprabhu had the most elevated in terms of the concept of discussion is what we are discussing today this is the eighth chapter of the madhya leela the lord chaitanya mahaprabhu has discussions with one of his most intimate associates ramanand rai and the nature of this discussion is quite distinct god is the wisest of all people one of his opulences is knowledge it's not that just god is more knowledgeable than everyone else rather god is the source of the knowledge of everyone else it is not that you know there are 100 people and the 100 person knows more than everyone else but the other 99 people also can know more and one of them can know more that person can become the top god is not like that 
God doesn't just know more than everyone else. God is the source of the knowledge of everyone else. So, buddhir buddhi matam asmi. Krishna says, I am the intelligence of the intelligence. Mattaha smitir jnanam apohanam I who give knowledge to everyone. Now, this same God, who is the source of the knowledge for everyone, he is in this particular conversation, not the transmitter of knowledge, but the receiver of knowledge. In fact, there are several very significant discussions on philosophy and theology that Lord Chaitanya has with his associates. And all of them are put together by Srila Prabhupada in his book, The Teachings of Lord Chaitanya. So there is the conversation with Sarom Bhattacharya, which chronologically has already happened, the sixth chapter in the Madhya Leela. Then there is the discussion with Ramanand Rai. Then later on, there is from the 18th, 19th to 24th, 25th chapters in the, this very Adilla. There is the instruction to Rupa Goswami, instruction to Sanatana Goswami, and there is the instruction to, there is the conversion of Prakashan and Saraswati. Hmm. Now all these are philosophical discussions, but in all of them, Lord Chaitanya is the speaker. This is the only conversation in which Lord Chaitanya is the hearer. And how is this? That Lord Chaitanya is revealing the highest truths when he himself is the highest truth and he is the knower of the highest truths. So that is the intimate exchange of love between the Lord and his devotees. So that is embodied here through a metaphor. So what is the metaphor? That the ocean is the source of water. Gaur Abdi, as said in this verse. Abdi means ocean. So Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is like the ocean. He is the source of all wisdom. Now, when the knowledge, when the water from the ocean is evaporated, it goes up to the sky and forms a cloud. And that cloud sometimes goes in to inverse to the land and showers water on the land. And sometimes the cloud showers water on the ocean itself. The water that is showered on the ocean by the cloud has come from the cloud itself. So the example is given, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is like the ocean and Ramananda Rai is like the cloud. Rama Bhida Megha. Megha means cloud. So the cloud known as Rama, Ramanandarai. So it is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself who from within the heart of Ramanandarai gives him the intelligence to speak this, this confidential message. And when he speaks this, Lord Chaitanya himself feels enraged. Just like an ocean when abandoned water showers on it, when the processing takes place within it, the ocean becomes filled with jewels. The jewels of Bhakti Siddhanta Chayamritani. That the jewels of the nectarian conclusions of Bhakti. So these, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself became embraced with them. And not only that, Vitiranais. Through this exchange, he distributed them for the whole world to relish. So this is a theme of Krishna's love for everyone that is foundational for understanding the sweetness of bhakti. That actually when we love Krishna, when we want to devote ourselves to Krishna, we submit ourselves to him. And that submission is often antithetical to our ego. So why should I submit to anyone? No, I am I, intelligent, I am smart, I can do many things. So we may instinctively resist submitting. But the nature of Krishna is that he doesn't delight in having others perpetually bow down to him. Actually, he delights in making and glorifying his devotees. And here he demonstrates how his devotee is, by his grace, elevated to such a level that he is speaking the highest conclusions and Lord Chaitanya himself is hearing those conclusions. So we will come to this theme of the Lord's love for his devotees by which the devotees, Ashla Prabhupada would say, 
the devotees become greater than Krishna. You know, Yashoda Mai, she ties Krishna up. And that is how God himself becomes conquered by the love of his devotees. So we will come to this theme gradually, but let's start with this verse now. And uh, the principle of love and how love can gradually evolve into bhakti. Love is the universal longing of the human heart. And not just the human heart actually. All living beings have the tendency to love and be loved. Even animals, even the most ferocious animals who can rip apart flesh and kill and they can seem, when they are doing this, they can seem heartless. But even those animals, they also love. And for the sake of love, even a tiger, a lion, the, uh, even a tiger or a lion, when they are taking care of their cubs or they are taking care of their mates, they are ready to fight. So, their language of love may not be so easily apparent for us, but it is there. And all living beings have that tendency to love. However, the tendency to love is expressed according to the level of consciousness of the living being. That means that in the animal body, the soul which is present is essentially similar to the soul that is present in our bodies. In 18.20, Krishna says that a characteristic of knowledge in the mode of goodness is to see that the same imperishable spirit this animates all living beings. Sarvabhuteshu ye naikam bhavam avyam ikshate avibhaktam vibhakteshu tajjyanam vidhisatvikam So the soul in a tiger's body or in a deer's body even a lizard's body is essentially similar to the soul of the human body. However, that soul's consciousness is less developed. And because it is less developed, the soul there cannot think of anything beyond the body we need. So therefore, the longing for love, which is there in everyone, how is that expressed? that is expressed in terms of their self-conception. So there is the longing for love, which is expressed primarily through the physical means, through eating, sleeping, mating, defending, and providing the arrangements for eating, sleeping, mating, defending for one's loved ones. Uh, for even animals, they, the, say when a baby bird is born, the mother bird and the sheep, uh, father bird, they often go out and search for food and get the food for them. And sometimes, uh, even among animals it is seen, even birds, if a number of birds have hatched and they are in the nest, some birdlets have hatched earlier. So normally when the, ma when the mother bird comes and drops some food into the nest, the bigger birds are able to catch it first. But amazingly enough, even these birds, they don't gobble the food themselves. They give it to their smaller siblings. They give to their smaller siblings and wait. When their mother comes again, they give the food. So that love, that affection is there in the heart of all living beings. And there it is expressed through the care in terms of providing for the bodily needs. When the soul comes to the human form, in the human form, actually our existence is divided. Our consciousness is, we could say, bifurcated between our spiritual understanding and our bodily understanding. At one level, we also have bodies which have their drives. And those bodily drives, they pull us. And because the soul has come from the animal bodies to the human body, so there is a momentum within the soul of pandering to body needs. So just as if a car has been moving for a significant amount of time, even if we press the brake, the car doesn't stop immediately. It keeps moving. 
So similarly, the soul which has been moving in the lower species towards seeking bodily gratification and not just seeking bodily gratification but providing bodily gratification to others. That momentum continues in the human body also. So this is one aspect which is just there in the human body for the soul which comes from its previous life momentum acquired in animal species. But along with that, the soul in the human body has some inkling of understanding that there must be something more to life. And that is why we long for life eternal and for love eternal. All living beings, they struggle against death. And they come up with the most innovative means to avoid death. And not only that, if we see a, among the most popular genre of literature in human society is probably romance. There are millions of romance movies, romance novels, there are millions of romance movies. And they all talk about the idea of happily ever after. Now if you consider from the Bhagavad Gita's perspective, there is no happily ever after. Bhagavad Gita says this world is Dukkhalem Ashashvata. So it's exactly the opposite. Happily ever after, Dukkhalem Ashashvata. Exactly, not happily Dukkhalem, not ever after, but Ashashvata. And yet the human heart longs for enduring relationships. So where does this longing come from? If we were simply materialistic creatures who had no spiritual component to ourselves, then we would not even long to live forever or to love forever. Because there is no conception of forever at the material level of reality. At mater in material existence, nothing is eternal. Nothing. Not even the huge twin tower building that was there, not even a gigantic, gigantic mountain that is there. Not even a, a, a huge iceberg that is there. Nothing lasts forever. So if we were simply products of matter, if our desires, if our consciousness, everything was a product of matter, then in the world of matter, we don't see anything that lasts forever. So why would we ever have a desire to live forever or to love forever? It's like, say, if a child is born in a remote African tribal village where the child has no access to anything else in the world except the village. No internet, no mobile, no technologies. Child's existence is limited to that village. And one day the child comes and tells his mother, Mommy, I want a pizza. So the first thing the mother will ask, where did you hear about a pizza? There's nothing in the child's circumstance that would ever give the child any knowledge about a pizza. So if such a desire for a pizza has come in the child, the mother will actually ask, where does it come from? So similarly, if nothing in our environment is enduring, nothing lasts forever, then where does our desire to live, where, live forever and to love forever come from? That doesn't come from our externals. It comes from our internals. It comes from our soul. The soul by nature is eternal. And because the soul is eternal, naturally the soul longs to live forever. When the soul misidentifies with the body, then the soul wants to, wants the bodily existence to go on forever. And the Bhagavad Gita explains, that the soul is a part of the whole. Mamai Vamsho Jeeva Loki Jeeva Bhuta Sanatana. In 15.7, Krishna says that the soul is his eternal part. And as a part, we are meant to naturally love and serve Krishna. So, our longing to live forever comes from our spiritual core, that is our soul. And our longing to love forever comes from the fact that the soul is a part of the whole. The soul is eternally a part of Krishna 
The soul is eternally meant to love and serve Krishna. And that is why we want to love forever. But as I mentioned earlier, love is expressed according to our conceptions. So when we conceive of ourselves as the body, then we long to live forever and love forever by forming a bodily relationship that will last forever. I've recently written a book on reincarnation, demystifying reincarnation. So when I was giving a talk, a student, a young man, he asked me this question, he's Indian. Uh, he said that I love a girl and I want to marry her, but our parents are completely opposed to it. We tried our best, but it's not working. So what karma can I do by which I can marry her in my next lifetime? <laughs> so the question is, even if one understand that I'm not the body and the soul, the idea is still that there's something called reincarnation, but even with that reincarnation, the focus is not shifted from the body to the soul. The focus is still that one is thinking somehow I am the body and she is the body and we want to have a relationship. And in India there are many movies, romantic movies which involve reincarnation. And their reincarnation is simply used as a plot extender. Somehow there is a villain who is very dangerous and he kills the hero and the heroine in frustration commits suicide. And then both the hero and heroine reincarnate. And when they reincarnate, they come in exactly the same body which they had earlier. So basically the hero and heroine play double roles, both of them. And then they come, they get re they reincarnate and then they kill the villain and they reunite. So here, what has happened? The idea of reincarnation is there and the longing for love is there. But the longing for love, even if one understands reincarnation is expressed still at the bodily level. Because one's understanding is at the level of the body. So the so in my answer I explained that you know we are all individual souls. And as souls, we have a vertical relationship with Krishna, which is eternal. And we have horizontal relationship with others in this world. This horizontal relationship, these horizontal relationships, some of them work out, some of them don't work out. That is just by the, by the kind of past karma that we have done, by the kind of past karma the other person has done. Now, now whatever it is, whatever love that we find in any relationship at the horizontal level, that love can be real, but that love is also ephemeral. It cannot last forever. Therefore, rather than trying to seek this love in a next lifetime, we have to understand where this love is coming from. Actually, whatever love anyone offers us, it is ultimately Krishna who is offering a glimpse of his love for us through that person. When a child is born in this world, the mother offers her breast milk to the child. It's a very intimate act of love. So the mother's love for the child is genuine. At the same time, is it only the mother's love for the child? The mother, when she gave birth to a child, she did not do anything special by which breast, her breast would secrete milk. The same God who sent a child through her womb into the world also arranged for milk to be there in her breast so that she could nourish that child. So the mother's love is real. At the same time, it is not the ultimate love. It is God who is expressing that love through the mother. In the fourth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, there is the story of Dhruva Maharaj. And Dhruva Maharaj's mother is a very saintly lady. But she is the less favored queen of the father of Guru Maharaj. <coughs> so when his, step, when his stepmother insults him, 
you know, he's shattered and his mother recognizes that she has no power to help him at that time so she tells her child her son that you know, whatever love i can offer you hmm? lord vishnu can offer you millions of times more love millions of times more love than what millions of mothers like me can offer can be offered by lord vishnu therefore at this time you take shelter of the lord so now this indicates two things first is that she actually for a mother who has nourished the child who, who in the early stages among all human all species in you know, the human species probably the among the few species where the newborn is totally dependent on the parents and totally dependent for a very long time so the bond that is formed between the mother and the child by the arrangement of nature is very close very intimate and yet suniti the mother of dhruva is recognizing that she is not the ultimate object of her son's love she sees herself as a director i have offered you my love but there is more love that is to be offered by the lord what this means is that firstly as i said <coughs> the first point is the horizontal relationships are meant to prompt us towards the vertical relationship whatever relationship we form in the world whatever love we experience in this world the ideal situation is in that love we are both we inspire each other to move towards krishna's love and also the love in this world is not false <coughs> if the love in this world were false if it were simply zero then when she is saying that vishnu can offer you millions of times more love now millions of times of zero is still zero so the love in this world is not false it is real but it is ephemeral it is temporary it cannot last forever it cannot satisfy fully the human heart's longing for love so the process of bhakti yoga is the process by which we learn to direct our innate loving propensity towards krishna so by me so by our very nature we long to love and based on our understanding of ourselves we direct that love in various ways so in human form as long as we think of ourselves as the body we direct that love at the bodily level <coughs> towards others <coughs> by spiritual knowledge we understand <coughs> that this love is meant to be directed towards the lord and this process by which we direct that love that process is the process of bhakti yoga so this process enables us to spiritualize our loving propensity to direct it towards krishna and to find lasting fulfillment therein now when we talk about directing our love towards krishna the important thing to understand is that love is not just especially love when it is understood in terms of bhakti is not just a emotion that we feel love is a disposition that we cultivate love is not just an emotion that we feel yes we may sometimes we come to a temple sometimes we participate in kirtans sometimes we hear some class and we feel very devotionally enriched we feel close to krishna we feel attracted towards krishna that is the emotion that we feel and it is good when we feel this emotion but at the same time love is not just an emotion that we feel love is also a disposition that we cultivate it is it is a disposition that we cultivate by following a particular process and that process is the process of bhakti yoga so in the great theistic religions of the world there is an understanding that god is the ultimate object of love at the same time to love god there are two distinctive aspects and this will actually bring us to this is just till now what i spoke was the background and from tomorrow i'll talk about the 
distinctive uh, contributions that Gaudiya Vaishnavism offers to the spiritualization of our love. That we need to love God is a teaching that is given in the th all the theistic religions of the world. However, for loving God, how do we do it? There are two distinct aspects to it. One is learning more and more about God. That the more we know someone, the more we find out how attractive, how wonderful that person is, the more loving that person becomes easier. So there is positive knowledge about God in his highest, sweetest manifestation of Krishna that is given in the Bhakti tradition of India and specifically in the Gaudiya Vaishnava Bhakti tradition. And also, so the so when we talk about love, there are three aspects to it. There is the subject of love, the person who is experiencing that love, who is offering that love. There is the object of love. There is the person to whom we love, whom we love. And there is the emotion of love. So in a loving reciprocation, there is the subject, there is the object, and there is the emotion. So now, the subject, through basic philosophical understanding, we understand that we are eternal beings. And therefore, we should love the eternal Lord. So that is the understanding of the subject, which we focused on today. Then there is the understanding of the object. Who is God? What makes him so lovable? That the more we understand it, the more the attraction towards him <coughs> can develop. So that knowledge about Krishna and knowledge, we'll talk about two aspects of the knowledge, knowledge of Krishna's greatness and knowledge of Krishna's sweetness. How both of them contribute to increasing our attraction towards him. And secondly, so, so thirdly, rather, the first is the subject of love, that is we ourselves. The second is the object of love, that is God, Krishna. And the third is the emotion of love, bhakti. So how is that developed? There is a process by which love can be developed. And that process is what the, is what bhakti yoga is about. And this process is most systematically delineated in the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition. And the various stages through which love can develop, the spiritualization of human emotions, first the, the spiritual education of human emotions and the spiritual elevation of human emotions. Both of this is provided in the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition. And there is the concept of rasa, which will be the focus of our fourth class, which is the distinctive contribution of the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition to Vaishnava tradition also. So I'll talk about all this, but just this is a point about cultivation, <coughs> which I'll mention briefly and I'll elaborate later. Uh, so the idea that love or bhakti is an emotion to be cultivated. This is foundational for sadhana bhakti. Sadhana bhakti is the process where we practice bhakti as a discipline. You know, people often talk about, say, I, uh, I fell in love with someone. You know, in movies, in novels, they talk about a hero and a heroine. They see each other. When they see each other, you know, they feel as if electric current has passed through their body. And they feel they're attracted to each other. They see we fell in love. Now, when they talk about falling in love, what does it mean? You know, when we fall, it's not, it's not intentional. If I slip and I fall, it's just automatic. So initially, there may be an overwhelming attraction, which is there. But if that alone is the basis of the relationship, then just as people fall in love, after some time they will fall out of love. Initially, when they find the other person very attractive, they fall in love. But after they come closer, they find that this person has so many other attributes also which I don't like. Then involuntarily they fall in love and involuntarily they fall out of love. <coughs> so, there is the 
voluntary intention that is required. Okay, if I decide to form a relationship with someone, even if I see that the person has some qualities you're not so attractive, but I'll focus on the attractive aspects and I will commit myself to the relationship. Only then the relationship will grow. So similarly, this principle of so love is an emotion, but love is also a decision. This is the person with whom I have decided to form a relationship, so I am going to commit myself to this relationship no matter what happens. So similarly, Bhakti Yoga is a process which requires the decision, the dedication, the commitment to practice. So sometimes we feel attracted to Krishna, sometimes we may not feel attracted to Krishna. But by the steady practice of Bhakti, that attraction to Him will awaken. <coughs> and that knowledge of how love for Krishna can develop and how all dharma, all principles of religion that are talked about both in the world's religions as well as in the Vedic tradition, all of them culminate in the process of bhakti which culminates in prema, pure love for Krishna. That is the subject of the conversation between Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Sri Ramananda Rai. And that we will discuss in our future talks. So I'll summarize and then we can have a few questions or comments if there are any. So I spoke today about the evolution from love universal to bhakti confidential. Uh, started by, in this verse, how Chichetan, first I talked about the principle of uh, that God, who is the source of all knowledge, is now becoming the receiver of knowledge. Just as the ocean has all water, but it gives water to the cloud and it gets back the water. So like that, Lord Chaitanya gives knowledge to Ramanandra and receives that knowledge. And in that, he feels enriched. He becomes delighted. This is the sweetness of Lord Chaitanya, of the Lord, that he makes a devotee greater than himself. And we started by, uh, we talked about love which is expressed at its highest in the reciprocation between the Lord and his devotees, that love is present in all living beings. Even animals, birds, express their love for their siblings by offering the food brought by their parents <coughs> to their younger siblings. Now, that, in the animal kingdom, the love is expressed primarily by seeking and providing the needs of the body, eating, sleeping, mating, defending. In the human form also, our love often gets expressed in these directions. But we, because we are souls with a developed consciousness, we also long to love forever, live forever and love forever. And this forever, it is not fulfilled at the material level. Nothing in the world of matter is eternal. And where this forever has come from, if you ask that question, we can point to our spiritual core. Just as a mother asks, where does a tribal child get the desire for a pizza? Now, uh, the bhakti wisdom, the bhakti literature explains that our love comes from our spiritual core because the soul is eternal and the soul is a part of the whole, eternally. So we are meant to love Krishna, but instead, not knowing about Krishna, we direct our love in this world to various objects and people. So the horizontal relationships, they can offer real love, but they are not eternal. So if we don't have proper spiritual knowledge, then we try to eternalize the horizontal relationships, as is depicted in romantic movies about reincarnation. <clears throat> but we need to spiritualize that love if you want to eternalize it. So as Dhru Maharaj's mother said that, the love that I offer you millions of times more Lord Vishnu can offer. That means, what is she doing? The love in the horizontal relationship is real. But she's saying this is meant to direct us towards the love in our vertical relationship with Krishna. And <clears throat> all the religions of the world, theistic religions, talk about making God the ultimate object of love. Now in love there is a subject, there is the object, and there is the emotion. So the Bhakti literature explained that the subject is actually eternal spiritual being, the soul. And then the object, God, is an all-attractive, all-loving supreme person. That's what Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, his beauty, his sweetness will be revealed by Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. 
uh, through the discussion and there is the process of love. The process of so emotion, bhakti is not just an emotion that we feel, it is also a disposition that we cultivate. So just as people may fall in love and then fall out of love, both is involuntary, involuntary but to have a committed relationship one has to have a voluntary intention and dedication. So by similarly cultivating that voluntary intention and dedication to direct our love towards Krishna, we can also experience the supreme enrichment of the heart that comes when it becomes lovingly connected with Krishna. So thank you very much. Hare Krishna. So are there any comments or questions? Yes, Prabhu. Thank you, Prabhu. You were speaking about the horizontal relationships in contrast to our vertical relationship. I was wondering, does horizontal relationships refer only to material relationships? For example, wouldn't the relationship with the spiritual master be a vertical relationship? Yeah. Good question. So, is our relationship with the spiritual master a vertical relationship or is it a horizontal relationship? <clears throat> it is a vertical relationship in the sense that the spiritual master represents Krishna. And the spiritual master guides us to love Krishna. At the same time, it is not so in practice, in this world, we do have to have a reverential mode of relationship with the spiritual master. So the spiritual master trains us to love Krishna. And it's, that's, so that's in practice. Now if you consider in principle, the spiritual master is not Krishna. We have an eternal relationship with the spiritual master. At the same time, the spiritual master alone is not the eternal object of love. So Srila Prabhupada said, in an intimate conversation, one said that, you know, when you return to the spiritual world, I will introduce you to Krishna. And Krishna will be the object of your love. That doesn't mean we neglect the spiritual master. So, yes, this, it's, we could say the relationship with the spiritual master is also a part of the vertical relationship with Krishna. At the same time, it is the relationship with Krishna that is eternal. In the sense that Krishna is the eternal longing of our heart. So no jiva, the spiritual master is an extraordinarily empowered jiva, but no jiva can replace Krishna. In fact, in many schools, in many monistic schools of thought, actually it is the relationship with the spiritual master which is itself eternalized and absolutized. And then the guru is thought of as God, which is not the Vaishnava understanding. So we do respect the spiritual master and that relationship is vertical in the sense that we all want to love Krishna and the spiritual master guides us towards loving Krishna. But at the same time, the spiritual master is not a substitute for Krishna. You know, we have in our own tradition the example of <coughs> Shamanand Pandit and Rasikananda Thakur. No, Shamanand Pandit was a spiritual master and Rasikananda Thakur was his disciple. And both of them were exalted Vishnas. And eventually, when both of them they would, they, tra they would travel in Bengal, Orissa, and they would give talks together. And after that, people would come, they would be inspired for initiation, and both of them would give initiation together. Some of them would take from Shaman and Pandit, some of them would take from Rasika and Thakur. So, ultimately, the Prabhupada explained the spiritual master is a person, but the spiritual master is not just a person. The spiritual master is a principle. That means the spiritual master is a person who infuses in our heart the principle of loving Krishna. Who gives, so whoever inspires us to love Krishna, whoever inspires us most to develop the vertical relationship with Krishna, that is the spiritual master. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Thank you, Prabhu. Just a reflection, I was uh, appreciating the, uh, the description of how even the tiger as a loving propensity, I was reminded of this preface to the Nectar of Devotion. And Srila Prabhupada says a couple of really nice things. He says, uh, Our loving propensity expands just as a vibration of light or air expands, but we do not know where it ends. The Nectar of Devotion teaches us the science of loving every one of the living entities perfectly by the easy method of loving Krishna. 
We have failed to create peace and harmony in human society even by such great attempts as the United Nations because we do not know the right method. The method is very simple, but one has to understand it with a cool head. The Nectar of Devotion will teach us how to turn the one switch on that will immediately brighten everything everywhere. One who does not know this method is missing the point of life. I thought you really captured that nicely. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? I don't think I can <clears throat> have um, articulated the thoughts properly in my mind, but this is what's coming at the moment. Um, yeah, uh, mistrust and fear of God. Um, how can this bhakti, you say the bhakti process, it helps to develop that love for God, but there's that mistrust and fear. So how does that pro the process work? to diminish or remove those feelings. Okay. So if, if we have mistrust or fear for God, how does the process of bhakti diminish that? Or how does it work in this situation? Bhaktivinoda Thakur in his Chaitanya Shikshamrit talks that there are four levels at which people may approach God. Fear, desire, duty, and love. And in the Bible also it is said that fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. It's not the end, it is the beginning. So fear in itself is not a bad thing. There is healthy fear and there is unhealthy fear. So if you understand that God is far, far greater than us, He is the ultimate controller. And therefore, we need to, it's not fear in the sense of terror, that God may do something terrible. Rather, fear in the sense that, ultimately, for a devotee, the fear is, I don't want to displease Krishna. That is, a, that is fear in, an, in the process of bhakti. I don't want to make Krishna unhappy. I don't want to make Krishna angry. It's like if you consider a child. If, say, the, if the, the parents are good, and the parents want the child to go on the right track, and if somehow the child, because of mischievousness, tends to do something wrong, and the fear, oh, my parents will be angry, that will protect the child from doing wrong. So, if fear of God curbs us from doing wrong things, then that fear is good. So, in general, especially depending on the modes we are in, so there is mode of ignorance, mode of passion, mode of goodness, and transcendence. So we could roughly correlate these four levels with these four levels of consciousness. In ignorance, there is fear. So when we don't know much about God, we are afraid. God is some unknown, powerful, fearful being. And I had better obey him, otherwise he will make my life miserable. So that is also good, because at least there is some obedience to God. But as we move forward from the mode of passion to the mode of goodness, mode of ignorance to the mode of passion, then we see God a little more positively. Passion is characterized by desires. I want to get this, I want to get that. <coughs> and I am not able to get it. God is more powerful than me. If I pray to him, he will give it to me. <coughs> so here we see God more positively, not as the source of punishment, but as the source of fulfillment. Fulfillment at the material level. Fulfillment of our desires. Then beyond that, we see God, and we come to the mode of goodness at the level of duty. That I have, I'm, that so much has been provided by God already. Right now I'm living, my breathing, how am I able to breathe? When I eat food, I may work hard to get the food, to earn the money to get the food, but who digests the food? I don't do it. It's a whole complex mechanism which is happening. So actually God has already provided me so much. So even when I get the food, I don't produce the food in nature. It is provided by God. I simply procure it. So this understanding that God has already provided me so much, therefore I have a duty to serve Him. This is at the level of knowledge. Knowledge, not full spiritual knowledge, but at least knowledge in the mode of goodness. And then when we come towards transcendence, then we uh, learn to love God, not because of what He has, what He will provide us or what He has provided us, which are the motives in passion and in goodness, but 
simply we love God because he's so lovable so we love God not for what he gives us but for who he is so at our stage in our life because of certain if we have fear just as we keep practicing bhakti we start developing spiritual knowledge we start raising our consciousness rises through the modes and the fear will diminish and now as far as mistrust is concerned we have to at least at some broad level understand what is the source of this mistrust now it may be because we may just be afraid of relationships itself we may have had bad experiences in various relationships and then we think relation relating with god is also another relationship what if it goes wrong what if i am disappointed it could be that or it could be just some misunderstanding of god's greatness because of which you know we counted on god to help us in particular situation and he did not help us then we may feel that what is the use of relating with god this is where philosophy is very important you know the the process of bhakti is we often expect god to help us by giving us release from problems krishna i have this problem please release me from it and if you release this us then we say yes krishna is good is krishna can release us from problems also and many times he does that however the nature of the material world is problems will come again and again some problem or the other will come so the deeper blessing that krishna offers us is not a release from problems but relief amidst problems and the problem remains but by remembering krishna by praying to krishna by absorbing ourselves in krishna we find that actually you know we are not that troubled you know we may be in pain and say materialist people when they are in pain they just cry they scream and cry a devotee cries out to krishna and crying out to krishna a devotee experiences a elevation of consciousness the experience is relief so mat chitta sarva durgaani mat prasada tarishasi sri krishna says if you become conscious of me you will pass over all obstacles by my grace he is not saying obstacles will go away you will pass over them so so if our mistrust has originated because we prayed to krishna for help and the help didn't come then we have to gain proper philosophical understanding at what what do we mean by krishna's help if we reduce krishna's help to a particular form then we may be frustrated but if we stay open the problem may still be there but the remembrance of krishna the absorption of krishna will give us relief <clears throat> and lastly the mistrust in krishna may come because of mistrust in those who represent him in our lives and sometimes you know the historically the biggest cause of atheism is actually theists people who claim to represent god but they misrepresented god they used their supposed connection with god to exploit others so in if that is what has happened you know if those who we trusted were connectors with god somehow let us down then we have to understand that actually <clears throat> that our relation our relationship with krishna is not meant to be reduced to any one channel alone if you see in the famous verse in the bhagavad gita tad vidhi pranipatena pariprashnena sevaya upadekshanti te gyanam gyanina tattva darshina krishna says that go to spiritual master and learn from him now if you look at the original sanskrit the sanskrit is gyaninas it's not gyani it's not singular it's plural as krishna is saying go to the enlightened souls and learn from them not just one so we have one diksha guru but we have many shiksha gurus and krishna can teach us from many sources so if it has happened that somebody is representing krishna has misrepresented him and because of our mistrust in them we have mistrust in krishna then we have to look for other representatives of krishna we may repose our faith gradually but we have to understand that we are not just trusting this person we are actually trusting krishna krishna tells us to follow this process 
of trusting his representatives so therefore even when we are trusting a representative of krishna we are essentially trusting krishna and if somehow it happens that somebody who is representing krishna some of they disappoint us then we we'll continue to trust krishna and find some other representative of krishna whom we trust and thus we can move on in our life so basically we have to find out the source of the mistrust and address that and in general if we start if we keep practicing bhakti consistently what will happen by that is that it itself will strengthen our trust and remove the mistrust yesham tvandigatam papam jananam punya karmana te dwandva moha nirmukta bhajante maam drida prata krishna said if just somebody keeps practicing bhakti diligently as diligently as is possible in the situation then the doubts and the dualities will go away and then the whole hearted faithful devotion will emerge so with whatever little trust we have right now we start practicing bhakti and gradually that trust will increase and the mistrust and the fear will get sidelined does it answer your question thank you so uh, everyone wants to um, experience love in the material world and sometimes we hear from Shiva Prabhupada that he said there is no love in this world so um, how can we understand that statement with uh, understanding that there is a yeah. level of love yeah it's... so sometimes we hear from Shiva Prabhupada that there's no love in this world yes <coughs> no <clears throat> actually scripture if we see when it is taking one angle and not a scripture which la prabhupad when they are taking one perspective they focus on that one perspective and then other times they give other perspective also so for example prabhupad many times says that there is no happiness in the material world hmm? but then prabhupad also quotes an act of devotion he talks about various levels of happiness and he says that happiness in the earth thousands of times more than that is the happiness in the heavens then thousands of times more than that is the happiness in brahma loka thousands of times more is the happiness in 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 um, in the brahma jyoti and thousands of times more happiness is there in the spiritual world so now again this hierarchy indicates that there is some happiness here or even now rashtra is coming we have this beautiful radhika ashtakam where is the vishva brin vishva vande it says okay how there are various levels of beauties there are beautiful women in this world there are the apsaras in the spiritual in the heavens then there are the goddesses of fortune and then there are gopis and then there is radharani whose beauty whose qualities are far far more than everyone else's so again there is a hierarchy over here so the point is and if we consider philosophically also krishna says in the, the whole chapter vibhuti yoga 10.41 it gives the principle but the whole 10 chapters we bhuti yoga which says that yad yad vibhuti matsattvam shrimadurjitam eva va tatta deva va gachchatvam mam tejo amsha sambhava that whatever is attractive in this world it manifests a spark of krishna's splendor so that means there are attractive things in this world krishna if it's manifesting a spark the spark is not the whole but the spark is real and the spark cannot provide us the satisfaction that the whole can provide but if it is a spark coming from the whole if it is manifesting a spark of the whole that means it also has attractiveness so the bhagavad gita does not reject in that sense that there are attractive things in this world and actually attractive things they evoke attraction and attraction is a form of love <coughs> so when we say <coughs> that anjali prabhupada says there is no love in this world Now, th- that statement has to be seen in the light of other statements in scriptures so basically there is the idea that the love in this world itself is the ultimate that's what people think i know that's all people are so enamored by that fascination with love so then it is it's nothing nothing to be so excited about so there is a word so what applies for love also applies for happiness because in love we get happiness 
So there is one verse in Prahlad Maharaj's prayer to Narasimhadev which reconciles both. So he says, Kutra Shisha Shruti Sukham Brigatrish Nirupa Kvedam Kalevaram Ashesha Rujam Viroha Nirvidyate Natu Jano Yadapi Tividwan Kamanalam Madhulavai Shamayan Durapai So he says, Narasimhadev is telling him, he's asked, what benediction do you want? And Prahlad says, my dear Lord, what benediction can I ask you in this world? Kutra Ashish, Shruti Sukha Mrugat Rishni Rupa. He says, actually happiness is something we only hear about in this world. But when we try to experience it, it is like a mirage. Mrugat Rishni Rupa. And he says, then what about the body? You can get so much enjoyment through it. He says, this body, Kvedam Kalevaram Ashesh Rujam Virayoho. It's simply a breeding place for diseases. So then, Nirvidyate Natu Janno Yadapeti Vidwan. Despite this terrible, dreary reality, people are not able to give up the desire for worldly enjoyment. And not just ordinary people, even Vidwan, even wise people can't give it up. Why? Why, Why is that? Kama Nalam Madhulavai Shamayandurapai. That in fulfilling Kama, in fulfilling desire, there is Madhulavai. There is a drop of nectar. Lava is a fraction. Madhu is honey or nectar. And that shamayan durapa, it's, it's almost irresistible to give up. So in the same verse, he's using two metaphors, which can seem contradictory. One is mirage, and the other is a drop of honey. So in a mirage, there is no water. In a drop of honey, there is a drop. So the, what is the reality? The mirage is not about the presence of happiness or the presence of love. The mirage is about the quantity of love or the quantity of happiness. No, we, when we are attracted to objects in this world, we think this will give me so much happiness, this relationship will give me so much love, that I'll be satisfied. So the, so the falsity is in terms of the mind's imagination that so sense pleasure is not imaginary. There is a little pleasure, madhulavai, when we engage in sense gratification. But what is the product of imagination is our, is our conception of the quantity. We think there is so much pleasure over there. We think there is so much love over there. But then it turns out to be so little. So Srila Prabhupada also points towards this when he says that, say the mother's love for a child is the nearest that we get to selfless love in this world. So in the, in the book Second Chance, Srila Prabhupada writes that parents naturally feel affection for their children. And he says that such affection is natural and necessary, but it is not spiritual. So Prabhupada is not saying it is false. In a mother, when parents take care of their children, when, say, when animals take care of their offsprings, that's natural. It's natural in the sense that it is produced by nature. It's necessary. The offspring would not be able to live without it. But it is itself not spiritual. So the, the statement that um, when Prabhupada said there's no love in this world, we have to see that in the light of other statements also. So there's no love in this world. It's like Prahlad saying, it's Mrugatrishmi, it's a mirage. But then when we see, he also says, Madhulavai. Oh, there is a drop. So the mirage is in terms of the quantity. We think there is a lot over here which will make us happy, but what is actually there is very, very little. So as compared to the promise that is there, what we get is so little that it is almost like nothing. This example is often given of this that suppose somebody is in a desert and they are dying of water and suddenly they see a helicopter coming along and the helicopter has written W-A-T-E-R and a helicopter lands. And then there's a person in uniform comes with a big jug of water. It's also written W-A-T-E-R. And this person moves his hand forward. And that person comes out, pours that big jug. And what comes out is one drop of water. And then that person just walks back to the helicopter and the helicopter flies away. Says, what? One drop? What is that going to do? It's almost like nothing. Isn't it? So, as compared to our longing and our imagination, the love and the happiness that we get in this world is like nothing. 
Hmm? But in principle, a drop of water is still some water. So the attractiveness in this world, attractive objects in this world, do manifest a spark of Krishna's spirit. The Bhagavatam also says in the Chatur Shloki, what is Maya? Maya is to rite artham yat pratiyeta na pratiyet chatmi tad vidyad atmano maya mitha bhasu yatatama to see things disconnected from Krishna that is maya so when I see this drop and I think this alone will be enough for me and that is maya and man that to expose that this, is, this drop is not going to satisfy us so acharya sometimes make not just acharya shastra also make a rhetorical statement that there is no love in this world so those statements if we see them in the proper light, that statement expresses one perspective. The other statement which expresses other perspective. Then we understand that in comparison to what we long for, the love in this world is so tiny that it is it is like nothing. Does it answer your question? Thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhaktavinda ki, Shetan Charitamrit ki, Hari Hari Bo. Yeah. <laughs>